The speaker for DCP, I yes, um, uh, um, uh, your uh, the, your the planner for DCP is here, so I'm going to move her into uh, panelist. And what's her name? Uh, Nabila. She'll be on in two seconds. I hope. Hope we didn't lose her. Oh, here is she. N A B E E L A. Yep. Yeah. Right. Nabila, are you there? Here, I don't know why she's not. Well, she's muted. Can you unmute her? I can only ask her to unmute her. There she Hi, is. Everyone. Oh, hello, hello there. Hello. Hi, Nabila. Been a while. How hey, are you? Hey, Hector, can you rename yourself? We're good, Nabila. Um, is there anybody else from your team that I need to bring over? Um, no, just me. Okay, great. Will you be showing a slideshow? Yes. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I have it. You sent it to me earlier. So I can either, if you would like to, I can give you the option to share your screen or um, um, I can just do it from my end and you can tell me when to Okay, go. if you wouldn't mind sharing it, that would be helpful. That is fine. Let me just do a quick uh, check. Um, yeah, so you guys have quorum. Um, we are recording uh, and we are uh, streaming live on YouTube. We okay. do have six attendees from the public. Um, I'm going to bring over uh, Mr. Botcher, who is in the audience. Okay. That's all right with you guys. Yep. And Does he want to be brought over? <laughs> Maya Burlow is also there. So. Is that is that it? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you're uh, you're the uh, speaker for the second item is here as well, so we'll bring him over when uh, we get to that item. That's Jay, uh, right? That's Jay. Yep, exactly. So if you guys want to start, that's whenever you're. That's whenever you guys want to start, you're up. It's your choice. All right. um, Betty, why don't you start because you're doing the first agenda item. Oh, Betty looks like she's frozen. Betty froze. Presentation and vote on a physical culture establishment. And uh, that is number two. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just give a thumbnail on the first item, zoning for coastal flood resiliency, co commonly known as ZCFR. And uh, we have the pleasure of Nibila Malik to present from City Planning. It's a proposal for a citywide zoning text amendment. It's updating regulations from the zoning resolution that were temporary created for emergencies. And uh, it will make permanent those regs and provide options to design and retrofit buildings and there's much more than just that. So we have a um, <clears throat> slideshow and just uh, keep gather up all your questions so then we can uh, have a robust co conversation about it. So you're, you're on. Nabila, before you start, I just quickly for the members of the audience, um, just to give them a heads up, if they are looking to ask questions or make comments on any of the agenda items, they can do so by raising their virtual hand, uh, which is uh, under the participant section and the chat section. Um, you should be able to raise your hand. There's an icon there for that. And if for some reason you cannot do that or cannot find it, there's the Q&A section. You can always ask a question in the Q&A and we can we'll be able to, the uh, co-chairs will be able to read it from there. Oh, and we should just, Introduce Eric Butcher from Corey Johnson's office. You want to make a wave, you know, and and we have Maya Burlo from Senator Hoyman's office. That's it for elected officials, right? Uh, reps. I, reps. I, I leave up. Hold on. I have Bert Lazar in attendees. I got to move him over. Sorry. Um, we have, and we have one other member who just says, "Please rename," but the video is not on. If you can just name yourself, please. 
Yes, you have to either, yes, please rename yourself or let us know who you are and then we, I will rename you. Oh, it's Bert. There we go. Oh, no, there's still another person. It's Mike Noble. Okay. Okay. Oh, Brad. 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 Thank you, Brad. Okay, so we're all ready for the CPC presentation. Give me one second. There we go. Does that work for everybody? Is everybody seeing that? Yes. Yep. Great. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nabila Malik. I'm a planner for Community Board 4 from the Department of City Planning. Um, and I'm going to be presenting a summary of the zoning for coastal flood resiliency um, proposal, which was referred out on October 19th. The proposal introduces updates to the zoning resolution sections related to um, flood resiliency measures and options. Next slide, please. Um, so just to begin with some background here, uh, while there are many sources of flooding that pose issues in New York City, coastal storms present the most significant flood risk in terms of compromising human safety, property damage, and business disruption. Uh, with 520 miles of coastline, New York is very much a coastal city. So when we're analyzing the city's coastal risk, we tend to focus on the area that FEMA designates as the high risk flood zone, um, the area that has a 1% chance of risk of being flooded every year. However, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy woke us up to a more widespread risk by inundating well beyond that 1% area. Close to half of the properties that are technically classified as being at moderate risk of flooding um, or having a 0.2% chance of flooding were inundated. In the two areas combined, so the 1% and the 0.2%, Almost a million New Yorkers live at risk of being flooded by a coastal storm. As you may all recall, West Chelsea experienced um, record surge levels as high as six feet in 2012. Um, and with climate change, the floodplain will continue to expand. So by the 2050s, today's moderate risk flood zone will likely be high risk for flooding. Next slide, please. To the wide range of challenges that come with flood risk adaptation, we need to pursue a strategy that involves multiple lines of defense. So the city's work includes coastal defense strategies, protection of our inland infrastructure like drainage and transit, and advanced emergency preparedness. But today we're focusing on the tools we have to help advance the resilience of our building stock. Next slide. So this proposal builds on two zoning text amendments that were put in place shortly after Hurricane Sandy to help coastal neighborhoods recover and rebuild quickly. But those zoning flexibilities, which were passed as a temporary emergency measure are beginning to expire. Um, the Department of City Planning conducted years of research and outreach, which uncovered many issues that communities are still facing. The proposal now is to make many of those provisions added after Sandy permanent and to expand them so communities have even greater flexibility for adaptation. Um, ultimately, zoning for coastal, oh, sorry, if you could stay on slide four, thank you. Um, so ultimately, zoning for coastal flood resiliency will help those living and working in the floodplain to reduce damage from future coastal storms, be resilient in the long term by accounting for future risks from including climate change, and potentially help save on flood insurance costs. It would also assist with disaster recovery from future disasters, including the present situation with COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
So before I get into the zoning proposal, it's important to understand what regulations apply to the construction or retrofitting of buildings in the floodplain today. Um, there are certain things that are required for new or significantly modified buildings in the floodplain, and those requirements are listed in Building Code Appendix G, which is regulated and enforced by the Department of Buildings. Some of these building code requirements are based on the building's location within the flood zone and what the building code calls design flood elevation, or DFE. DFE is the height that flood waters could be expected to rise plus additional freeboard or additional elevation for protection. So for residential buildings, all living spaces must be located at or above the DFE. Any space below must be wet flood proofed, meaning it's designed to allow water to flow in and out. And those wet flood proof spaces may only be used for parking, storage, and access. These buildings can't have any spaces below ground. Non-residential or mixed use buildings can be designed with the same wet flood proofing methods, but they also have the option to dry flood proof and locate some uses below the DFE. Um, dry flood proofing means meeting specific design and material requirements so that water cannot enter the building during a flood event. Um, the strategy allows uses to be located close to the sidewalk level, but it can be expensive and especially challenging in locations with high water tables or high DFEs. Next slide, please. Um, so the building code requirements in Appendix G started to become widely applicable soon after Sandy, when many were trying to rebuild and suddenly faced these new standards. The post-Sandy zoning regulations DCP put in place were, in were intended to make it easier for building owners to design to Appendix G standards without facing hurdles or conflicts from the zoning code. Um, since then, we've heard that there were still some issues that people faced when trying to recover. Um, our current rules mostly assisted buildings that can be physically elevated, such as detached houses. However, um, they were not enough in assisting owners that had to relocate all living spaces above the DFE or over elevate the lowest floor above future flood levels. Um, also, attached homes and multifamily buildings were not sufficiently addressed since they must evacuate spaces below the DFE and relocate them on top of the structure, which is a retrofit strategy that requires more flexibility. Um, and businesses were also not sufficiently addressed as they need high visibility from sidewalks, but also because many heavily rely on sellers or on being at grade for operations. Next slide. So after a long process of setting the floodplain and engaging with many stakeholders and the community, we were able to establish four overarching goals that help us move from Sandy recovery to a long-term resiliency strategy. So one, the floodplain community wants to be able to prepare buildings for flooding, even if they're not located in what FEMA currently determines to be the highest risk flood zone. Two, people also want the option to raise their occupiable space a little higher than the current flood level that FEMA projects because they have seen higher flood levels already and expect that risk to grow in the future. Three, residents and business owners want to be able to invest in resiliency incrementally so it's more affordable over time. They want options like moving their mechanical equipment to a higher elevation without necessarily triggering a requirement to raise or fully floodproof the structure. Four, we know that we need a way for the city to be nimbler in responding to future events that might require rebuilding homes or other forms of recovery. Next slide. So 
So um, now for each goal, I'll present a set of strategies that help to achieve them and go over a selection of regulations that we are proposing. Um, important to note is that these proposed regulations maintain optionality, just like the 2013 regulations. So owners can opt into these resiliency measures. They're not mandated. Next slide. Um, so the first goal speaks to where the proposed zoning text would apply. Uh, these regulations are optional to help buildings undertake resiliency improvements. The proposal expands the applicability of the current text to a broader set of buildings that are also exposed to flooding in the event of coastal storms. Next slide. So any lot located within either the high risk or moderate risk floodplains would be allowed to use the proposed special options for resilient building design. So the 0.2% floodplain serves as a proxy for the high end projection of the 2050s 1% annual chance floodplain, um, allowing the city to advance resiliency in the longer term. Next slide, please. So this is uh, Community Board 4's applicability. You can see there's more coverage in Chelsea and Hudson Yards in orange, and the yellow is what is already included in the existing optional rules. Um, the yellow is the 1% floodplain, and then the dark orange is the 0.2% floodplain. Next slide, please. So this section illustrates options that would be available only if the building fully meets or exceeds Appendix G of the building code. And these are split into five separate categories. Next slide. So starting with building envelope, these optional rules would allow building owners to physically elevate habitable spaces and other building support features above expected flood elevations. Next slide. Currently, the 2013 flood text allows maximum height to be measured from the DFE, the design flood elevation. Um, and the DFE is currently called the FRCE in the zoning text or flood resistant construction elevation. However, um, this is only available for buildings in the 1% floodplain, which have a designated DFE in the building code. To allow buildings in the 0.2% floodplain to take advantage of this rule, we will be setting a standard flood elevation of two feet to buildings in that 0.2% area. Next slide. So the current rules al also allowed extra height in situations where buildings are located in areas with certain high flood elevations. This extra height allows buildings to have a more useful ground floor. However, we learned over time that it also helps with long-term resiliency. Today, building heights can be bumped to 9, 10, or 12 feet, depending on the building's use and zoning district, making it a highly complex framework. Um, and because its applicability depends on the flood elevation level, site topography changes can lead to inconsistent outcomes that benefit some buildings more than others. Um, so the proposal would make those height allowances more consistent and equitably distributed so more buildings can be prepared in the long term and incorporate sea level projections in the design. To create a consistent framework, the proposal would allow building heights to be measured from a new reference plane that can be up to 10 feet above grade in the 1% floodplain and up to 5 feet in the 0.2 percent floodplain, as you can see in the in the graphic. Next slide. So next I'll talk about ground floor regulations. This set of rules would help promote
good long-term resilient design and neighborhood streetscapes. Next slide. So the current rule allows ground floors in existing buildings that are retrofitted to be wet flood proofed to be exempted from floor area. This helps buildings become resilient without having property owners lose a chunk of their building in the process. Um, this proposal would allow such exemption to apply to both existing and new proposed buildings. The intent is to apply the allowance more consistently and support new buildings adapting to climate change. Next slide. The current rules also include floor area exemptions for spaces that are dry flood proofed to promote active uses at the street level. So there are two sets of rules. On your left, you can see a provision that applies to existing buildings, which exempts the dry flood proofed space, but the buildings then have a hard time recouping the investment of making the building watertight because the uses for that space are constrained. Um, on the right, you can see a rule that applies to new and existing buildings, which allows any space to be exempted from floor area if more than half of the floor is below the flood level. And so we call these spaces cellars. The problem with the cellar exemption system is that it results in a squished ground floor with low ceilings um, that also ends up encouraging sunken ground floors. So ultimately these two exemptions ended up promoting buildings out of scale and ground floors that were less marketable um, and effective for active uses. Next slide. The proposal would modify these regulations to instead only allow the first 30 feet of a space that is dry flood proofed to be exempted from floor area, provided that the space is used for non-residential uses, complies with certain standard requirements such as minimum transparency requirements and internal clearance. So this would help encourage active uses close to the sidewalk level to promote a safe and lively pedestrian environment while making sure that the resulting buildings are not out of scale. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, this proposal would mandate a set of streetscape requirements to improve the ground floor level design of resilient buildings. Next slide. The proposed rules take existing streetscape requirements and make them more consistent and provide more design options to ensure that resilient buildings reflect and contribute to their surroundings. Um, the proposed framework, framework would require the design to include elements that earn either one or three points depending on the elevation of the first floor above the flood elevation. So for floors more than five feet above grade, points will have to be satisfied in two categories of mitigations. Um, and those categories are those that improve access and those that improve ground floor design. Next slide, please. So to meet those points, the proposal would provide a range of options for a variety of building types. Items are split into the access and design categories, and they would include additional options from what we have today. So the updated options are highlighted with an orange outline on the side. So you can see there's accessory residential use, additional fenestration, um, entrances close to the grade, to the grade level, um, recessed access, multiple entrance points. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, we recognize that not all buildings in all situations would be helped by our as of right rules. Um, therefore, the proposal would continue to offer discretionary pathways 
in the form of BSA special permits to ensure that unique situations and hardships based on issues like lot shape can get relief from certain zoning provisions in order to meet the Appendix G standards. Next slide, please. So the set of provisions located within this goal are what we call partial resiliency strategies. They will help building owners undertake incremental steps towards resiliency without requiring the structure or sites to fully meet Appendix G. Next slide. So um, we learned that raising mechanical equipment is often the first and most cost-effective step to make buildings more resilient. So the proposal would enable more options for the placement of mechanical equipment above the flood level, either on rooftops or in a separate structure. The proposal would allow for a wider range of placement options of such structures, provided that they are not placed too close to neighboring properties and do not exceed a certain height. Next slide, please. A big portion of the floodplain contains businesses that offer either neighborhood services or are part of the large industrial economy of the city. And many of these buildings cannot be completely elevated or dry flood proofed due to cost or operational needs. Um, but many of these business owners would like to raise priority spaces and equipment above harm's way so they can minimize business disruption in case of a storm event. Next slide. Through our resilient retail study, stakeholders identified that many businesses rely on below grade spaces for support services, especially when they're a mixed use building. Existing regulations prohibit most mixed use structures from using more than the first story for non-residential uses. And so if the building owners decide to fill in cellars to reduce the potential for damage, businesses wouldn't really have options to relocate the uses they had in their cellars. So the proposal would allow all commercial corridors in the floodplain to use the first two stories for non-residential uses, provided that there aren't subgrade spaces in the building. Slide 28, please. Um, the proposal would also enable different types of flood protection measures to be implemented. This would include allowances for flood panels and flood panels and landscaped berms to be considered permitted obstructions in open areas. It would also allow spaces used for the storage of panels to be exempted from floor area to enable on-site storage. Next slide. Um, when looking at our waterfront sites, zoning generally doesn't allow waterfront yards or, require, or required visual corridors to be raised um, to account for flood risk. Many sites at the water's edge are also required to provide public access using specific design standards and have little flexibility to accommodate best resiliency practices. This proposal would offer more flexibility for the grading of these sites and would facilitate resiliency measures such as soft shorelines. Um, next slide, please. So now on to the final goal, which is different from the previous ones in that these rules would apply, would mostly apply not just in the floodplain, but on a citywide level. Next slide, please. Sandy showed us how a storm's effects can go beyond the floodplain, especially regarding issues with our energy grid. Um, so the proposal will allow power systems, including generators, solar energy systems, um, fuel cells, and batteries to be considered permitted obstructions in open areas across all zoning districts. Next. 
Uh, in addition, to ensure that all areas of the city can easily provide ADA access, the proposal would classify both ramps and lifts as permitted obstructions in all required open areas to facilitate accessible design. Next slide, please. Another important issue is how disasters, especially those that require the evacuation of residents, impact vulnerable populations. Next, please. Um, so the city believes it would be appropriate to limit the growth of nursing homes in high risk areas to lessen the health consequences and logistical challenges of evacuating the residents of those facilities. The proposal would prohibit the development of new nursing homes within the 1% floodplain and other selected geographies likely to have limited vehicular access during a storm event. Existing facilities would still be able to conduct enlargements for modest improvements including those that help with resiliency. Next slide. So Sandy showed us that a lengthy process to update zoning regulations can slow disaster response. The proposal would make certain recovery provisions available to be enabled quickly following future disasters. And some of these provisions would be implemented now to help address the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated economic effects. Next slide. So currently, immediately following a disaster, the mayor can issue emergency orders to temporarily remove obstacles to facilitate recovery efforts. But that process is limited to the duration of the disaster um, which may not be enough time to address regulations um, that would hinder a longer term recovery. So this proposal would include a series of disaster recovery provisions that could be made available through a text amendment when a disaster occurs. Applicable recovery provisions would be selected based on the issues caused by the disaster and would be available for a limited time period um, and that time period would be set at the time of the text amendment. Uh, the provisions could be limited to designated recovery areas based on the disaster's impacts and the city's recovery plans. Next slide, please. The set of provisions that could be made available are drawn from lessons learned from Sandy as well as the current pandemic. Examples or rules in this menu include modifications to the damage and destruction thresholds to allow the reconstruction of non-complying buildings and non-conforming uses, and rules that could allow uses in zoning districts where they are not typically permitted on a temporary basis. While these options would be included in the zoning resolution text, they would not all be enabled as part of this action. Next slide. Um, considering the situation we're going through right now with COVID, the proposal would include enabling two sets of rules to help support more predictable long-term recovery efforts. The first one would give property owners who hold special permits and authorizations an additional term so that they can complete their original plan of construction on a longer term line, on a longer time, timeline. As um, some of you may be aware, special permits and authorizations have expiration dates. Um, so this would provide the flexibility of an additional term. Um, the, second, the second provision would support businesses that do not conform with zoning use regulations by allowing them more than two years, which is the current limit of discontinuance, to return to operation. So um, this, is, this is the end of the proposed changes. If we go to the next slide, we can talk about next steps. Um, so the citywide text amendment is being 
um, proposed to follow the ULERP process clock, as you can see here. Um, community board resolutions are due by December 28th. And more information about the project, um, including an annotated version of the proposed zoning text can be found on our website. Um, so thank you for allowing me time to share this update with you. And I'm happy to take any questions. I may not have immediate responses. Um, the proposal is being led by our zoning division, but if I can't answer anything, I'll take it down and follow up. Before we open up, Betty, do you mind if um, I ask privilege to, just can you go to page 11 of the slide? I wanna see where community district four's borders are. And if there's a way that we can zoom in a little bit more on that, because as members ask questions, I want you to look at it and think about the neighborhood that you know and um, how these rules might impact. Because a lot of the pictures are from like Rockaway Beach and whatnot. But um, I'd, I'd be interested to know if this zone is in our historic district, um, how it's gonna impact Hudson Yards. It looks like um, uh, Moynihan Station is in here. So there's a lot of areas that, is there a way that we can see better our district board borders here and the streets on there? So those streets are not really visible. Yeah, unfortunately the map doesn't show um, the streets, but the blue outline is all of is all of CB4. Yeah. Thanks. Betty? Betty muted. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. Now, all committee members, there'll be a quiz after this about uh, all these terms. It's, it's, it's actually, I find it quite daunting. It's a lot of, there's a lot of detail. So um, why don't we open it up for questions uh, from committee members? I have a few questions, but I'll hold, hold back until everybody else gets a chance to ask a question. You could uh, do your blue hand and participate. Oh. So, or you could just raise your hand if you want. I can see if you raise your hand, that's probably easier. Well, hey. there's some, there some hands already raised in the box. Oh, all right, go there first, okay. Yeah, since okay. they're in the order. Well, fortunately, David's hand looks like it's first. David, you unmute? Yeah, um, I'm a bit concerned because uh, the area that's affected, it does overlap with the Chelsea Historic District. Um, and, you know, zoning is traditionally sensitive, not just to the ground plane, but to existing rooftops and contextual zoning. Uh, so, for example, the relatively new zoning along the High Line includes limits so that buildings along 10th Avenue step down across from the Chelsea Historic District to become more contextual in height with the historic district. Um, and it's my understanding from what you presented, Nabila, that both height limits on buildings would be elevated and uh, FARs could effectively be enlarged when um, lower floors are considered no longer contributing to FAR. So I'm concerned about what the impact might be on the way buildings relate to each other. And as I'm sure you know, there's a, a high priority, especially in West Chelsea on luxury penthouses and views above existing uh, construction that exists. It's kind of like an, an arms race among the penthouses. Is there any kind of um, uh, consideration in your plans for, for that? So what I'll, what I'll say is that um, all the existing zoning regulations, inclu including the special West Chelsea district regulations are all still in play, still required. The, the zoning for coastal flood resiliency is, is providing the optionality where owners can opt in if they are trying to meet Appendix G requirements. Um, and so with that said, the historic district, um, any, any building that would want to opt in to these new regulations 
um, would still have to go through LPC review as standard procedure. Right, but let's say it's outside of the historic district, but bordering on it. Um, I, you, you mentioned that uh, the special West Chelsea zoning along the High Line would still be in force, but it sounds as if buildings could now be taller by virtue of uh, considering the datum line, the, the base from which they're building upward to sure. be elevated so, somewhat. Yeah, so buildings will, they will be able to be a little taller um, if they are meeting flood resiliency measures. So that's, that's you know, the trade-off. If they are um, producing a building that is responsive to climate change and um, trying to mitigate the, the flood risk, then yes, that they can slightly increase in height. I just want to follow up with what David was saying. Is there any maximum amount they can add on, say, to the height of a building? So yes, it's it's basically you're following the district regulations, but you can begin the height from the design flood elevation. You would count the height from the design flood elevation. Okay, just to continue with with regard to the historic district, you know, I'm particularly concerned about how this would impact areas like the the Chelsea Historic District, which is primarily made up of row house blocks. And uh, one issue that we've had is that developers will buy these houses, uh, which have an FAR of three, by the way. And that, you know, isn't too much above what the existing row houses embody in terms of their use of FAR. What they'll often do is to take the so-called English basement that's entered under the stoop that is slightly below sidewalk level, and they'll lower the floor of that to get it, the average volume of that cellar, of that basement space down into what DOB considers a cellar that does not count as floor area. And then they'll blow out the back and uh, create a, a really uh, outsized addition that begins to impinge on the historic rear yard space and just change the character of the block altogether. It sounds like the basement not counting as FAR would even happen automatically uh, under what you're proposing in the case of parts of the Chelsea Historic District that fall within the floodplain, the 2% part. It, we, you know, it's, it's going even farther with the 2% consideration than uh, previously, 0.2%. Um, so, you know, it, is there any uh, possibility of uh, making a special sort of uh, cutout for the historic district. Um, I can I can bring that to our zoning division's attention, but um, th the attempt here is to provide um, consistent and equitable regulations that do allow buildings to accommodate flood risk. And you know, given that Chelsea was hard hit during Sandy. Um, you know, we do feel that it is important to allow building owners to have flexibility um, to meet these mitigation options. Yeah, I, you know, not to belabor this, but uh, one of the problems we have is that developers, sometimes from the far side of the planet, uh, will buy a row house in Chelsea with the intention of maximizing uh, its area and flipping it. Um, and the Landmarks Commission often allows them simply to preserve the street facade and an entirely new building goes in behind. And I'm sure that these developers do all of the calculations in advance for the maximum area that they can create. And because the underlying land value has escalated so much here since the development of the High Line, it's bringing a huge market force on the destruction of the substance of the historic district. And I'm just worried that this may contribute further to that. I, I, you know what I think um, off the top of my head, um, maybe city planning could look at those kind of cases and just um, 
see what the implication could be. It may not be an example that city planning has looked at in terms of the various housing types. So that's just my two cents about that. What do you think, David? Maybe they yes, could- Yes, I'd, I'd agree that they, that could, they should they do that. And look, look at the envelope, how, how it's preserved, but then how developers expand it, particularly going down in the basement. It may not be an example that city planning has too, is too familiar with. And I wonder if there's a way of uh, introducing an element of resilience that doesn't have to do with uh, uh, these spatial considerations. And I don't know exactly what that might be. It might be a, a fund for rebuilding that uh, you know could be made available to uh, people. I don't know where the money from that would come from, whether it would be tax dollars. But my hope is simply that it would be something that doesn't end up being abused by uh, uh, speculators. Anyway, thanks, thanks for that question, David. Um, Marty, you're next. Unmute. Marty, yeah. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Nabila, for presenting uh, a, a complicated uh, set of a piece of information. I have two questions, one angry and one curious. Um, I, the first is, I looked through the materials that we were given before this meeting. Um, it, it's extremely frustrating to me to look at so much information that's not in my wheelhouse. There's no way for me to take it all in in a serious way. Uh, the presentation and the material that was presented to us is not targeted to our district. It is general for the entire city and those of us like David, and thank you, David, for your questioning, have to uh, narrow it down and try and figure out what is and what is not targeted to us. So it, the, the complexity and the, uh, the, the discussion that's not directed at us and a decision that we need to make within 60 days sort of really infuriates me, what the hell? We're, we're volunteers. This is, this is way outside of our scope. And uh, I don't know what the chairs and what the uh, chair of the board intend us to do. I don't know what we're voting for. Come on, it's totally unreasonable. Second question, uh, what effect does the big U have on all of the information that you're presenting to us? Uh, big U projects do not exist on the west side, they go down. They go from community board to, not in community board to, but south of community board to, around to the east side. If there were a serious barrier built uh, along the Hudson River on uh, the Hell's Kitchen and um, Chelsea area, that effectively would prevent storm surge from coming into our area. How does that affect all the gobbledygook that you've been presenting to us? Um, first so, question is really directed at, at, at the chairs of the, the committee. I, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's your fault, Nabilia. Uh, maybe it is. I don't know that, it, that the information you gave us isn't targeted to us. And the second question you can, you can deal with as well. So I'll, I'll first just say that uh, to your first question about it not being targeted to CB4, what the information I have presented, this is a citywide text. And so what I'm presenting are these general regulations that do, they also do apply to community board four. So any any property that's within the 1% or 0.2% floodplain can opt in to, um, to utilize these regulations of, you know, ADA access, elevating above the floodplain, um, you know, all of the other examples that were provided in the, in the goals. Um, and what I, what I can provide is what we have a one pager that's a little more digestible just to give you a good summary of everything that I've provided a link to in the chat. 
Um, I'll also right now actually provide you a link to, um, we have an annotated copy of the zoning text so that you can scroll through and see the changes and the additions um, that are being proposed um, with, with notes to help you um, navigate that. Um, so I will include that. Um, and, and then, you know, there were other, there were other rules that I presented that have to do, you know, with providing flexibility based on the current pandemic um, that would apply to, to properties in CB4 as well. Um, to your second question, that's an interesting point. I think that, um, you know, there are, there are other flood resiliency proposals that, that come in to, to the city. And um, I think based on those proposals, you know, there we would revisit the text um, in case there are conflicts or redundancies or if they make certain provisions irrelevant. Okay. Um, Betty, thank, you, thank you, Marty. Betty, uh, you, you, the two of you need to, what are we voting on? Are we voting on approving this entire set of complex issues? Is that, is that what we're being asked to do? I, I believe that is so. I believe that is so. Paul, do you want to opine? I'm also going to quickly defer to Jesse on this. My impression is that we opine on the overall thing, but we raise the issues that we're concerned about, such as the impact on historic districts, the impact on floor area ratio, mechanical voids, raising height of adjacent property to um, special districts, things like that. So we are going to put in a list of commentary that they will then incorporate into their discussions further down the line. Jesse? Right. I mean, that's correct. I mean, this is a citywide uh, amendment application. It's open to every community board to comment for the next 60 days um, and how they feel that the application needs to be altered in any way. I mean, in the past, you guys have done similar, um, you know, uh, letters in, ter in terms of, you know, you know, standard denial, that's the following considerations are taken into account, um, you know, um, so yes. So may I Marty, I, Marty, I look at it like the, we did the manufacturing zones allowing hotels. It was a citywide issue and they had um, implications directly for us. So we, didn't, we voted against the change unless these conditions were put into place that addressed our concerns. So, but that made sense for a, a much narrower set of issues. This is a hugely broad set of issues. And it would seem to me that we, because of who we are, I, I'm putting nobody down, understand. I'm really talking about my own ability to understand this material. We, I think we would be advised to write a letter that does not approve or deny the zoning text, but has questions about it. All right, so let's, um, let's have that as part of our committee discussion. Um, Marty, I think you raised a very Good point. But let's have that as part of our committee discussion. Let's get through questions from committee members. Okay. Let's let's go to Brad. Hi. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Brad. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't like when we hear that we are being told that we can't put in senior housing retirement housing in our district because that is what our district could possibly need let's say we take that jail that's sitting on 22nd and it becomes senior housing and now we can't do it because of this act of trying to do something right but in the end it creates a lot of wrongs right let, let, let me just uh clarify with city planning i believe that the proposal is for facilities like nursing homes, which are different from senior housing, but uh, Nabila can help us out on that one. Yes. Well, what I meant actually, hold on. What I meant to say is nursing homes. 
we shouldn't be told in our district that we can't put, if somebody wants to put a new nursing home, which we could use in our district in the floodplain, and now they can't. I mean, this is this is not right. This is not what I would vote for in any means. Uh, also, my second question is, uh, what is the insurance impact? You even created a bigger zone. Can the insurance companies now say you didn't do this and now your insurance is going up or we're not gonna provide you insurance? What, what is the mechanism on that? Um, so I'll, I'll answer the, the first question about nursing homes. So you're correct, nursing homes would not be allowed in the floodplain but in the 1% portion of the floodplain. Um, and and that's, that's for safety measures. Um, we, we conducted research on nursing home facilities um, and found that they're a population that's not capable of self-preservation or responding to um, an emergency without physical assistance or staff. So, you know, this is this is really to to protect vulnerable elderly populations that are in nursing homes in the event of an emergency because it has been proven difficult to evacuate um, evacuate that population. It doesn't mean that nursing homes can't be included elsewhere in CB4. It's just to protect that vulnerable population from having to live in a floodplain. And um, thank, thank you for that. Okay. And, and then the second question about the flood insurance: This wouldn't affect that because these regulations are optional. So owners are opting in. Um, if you don't opt in, it doesn't it doesn't change anything for you. Yeah, but insurance decides that, private insurance, just by city saying, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it, doesn't change the way now the insurance companies say, well, you actually are in a floodplain, you didn't do the, 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 the brownstone didn't uh, upgrade and move their mechanicals, which costs a fortune up top, and now you're going to pay higher insurance. I also would say to David's point, David, just like the uh, upzoning of the mechanical spaces in the towers that were accentuated with, by developers, it's the same thing that's gonna happen here. We know this, it's just that's no doubt it's gonna happen. Okay, thanks Brad for those points. Um, let's go to Mike Noble. Well, as usual, when David speaks before me, he covers most of the ground. <laughs> Thank you, David. But I do have uh, just a general question. Uh, whenever we have these uh, issues uh, that cross both uh, city planning, uh, landmarks, buildings and all, how much do you folks talk to landmarks when it comes to something like this? We're always all over it when it comes to landmarks. And I wonder if you are as well. Yes, yeah, so um, in in the time of, of this, the study leading up to this proposal um, and in developing the proposal itself, um, our, our zoning division would meet with LPC um, to discuss this, to discuss the the proposed regulations, um, the regulations that owners could opt into. Um, and, and so LPC is, other agencies are involved um, at the development of the proposal, um, as well as they have opportunities to comment during um, the, in the environmental analysis as well. So we don't see that until the end, if ever. And uh, what, do you, what do you mean we don't see it till the end? Well, I, if there's any input uh, by landmarks, <clears throat> there are no notes, there are no meeting notes or anything like that. Their concerns aren't necessarily uh, highlighted, are they? 
Are they? No, so typically in the development proposal, if LPC has raised concerns, it's usually resolved prior to um, issuing this. a proposal, <laughs> any sort of major concerns that LPC would have had um, would have been addressed before going out with the proposal. Oh. So was, was LPC involved in any dialogues or that resulted in any changes by city planning? I, I don't know the details of that. Um, I could try to find out. Okay, might've been another, well, other, it would other, be other nice. divisions. Uh, yeah, I always, you know, it would be nice to know how much there are, uh, they're advocating for us, you know? Uh, okay, I think that's, I think that's mainly my concern. Got the, got, got the uh, point on that one. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Carrie? Hi, um, sorry, I'm super new to this. So if this is a stupid question, I apologize in advance. Oh, there's but, no stupid <laughs> No, this one no might, might be, this might be. Um, are you talking about only new construction now from here on out? Sorry if I missed that. Um, no, so not just new construction, these, these regulations would also apply to existing buildings. So existing owners could opt in um, to, to renovate their buildings to, to meet some of these regulations if they wanted to. So I, how, so as a person who's lived, I guess, in an English basement for 22 years, how, how, what are we supposed to do? You know, I, I just don't, I'm, I'm really struggling with this, whether we're, you're in the historic district or not, this neighborhood and, you know, our entire district is filled with townhouses that have sunken apartments and gardens. And I'm not, I'm just like trying to wrap my head around it. That's one thing. Also, could you please provide a map, a better map for us so we could see exactly what you're talking about? And can you please let us know again where we can find the presentation you gave today versus the one pager, which I appreciate the brevity of it, but it, I do not find it helpful. Um, sure, so I emailed the presentation to Jesse. Okay, um, I didn't see it in the Dropbox. I could be me. There's a, there are documents, but that one doesn't seem to be there. Okay. Uh, the presentation was not put in the Dropbox yet. Jesse had to leave this call. I'll follow okay. up with Jesse to have that emailed around to Thank us. Thank you. And would you mind in that when you when we get that sending a better map so we can really see what we're talking about? I mean, this neighborhood is literally filled with three, four, five story brownstones that all have, you know, sunken apartments and gardens. Sure. And and I'll I'll definitely follow up with with a more detailed map for you. Um, to answer your question about um, the garden level English basement apartments. Um, so you don't have to do anything. Um, this is if a building owner um, would like to pursue flood mitigation measures, they can opt to do that if they want to. Um, so typically, you know, that might happen if a building owner is already deciding to renovate their building um, and then they would opt into this. But could you provide uh, what that looks like for this kind of building? Because I don't really think you've done that. Like if there is no way to raise anything and there is no way to build a barrier outside, it's just impossible. Like maybe if you... So yeah, so certain, certain buildings, it won't be possible to elevate them um, or to relocate certain things. Um, but depend, you know, it, it really just depends on how much a building owner is looking to renovate. If you're in a historic district, you probably won't be able to um, elevate your building because it will change the historic character um, and it would just be too costly or, you know, there are many constraints, um, but there are situations in which this greater flexibility would allow for a more resilient building. Um, Nabila, uh, Kerry raises an interesting question. Um, if 
if she was living in a building in, in a basement lower level and she was in the one percent or the two percent area then is if there was a big superstorm big surge is she vulnerable then if she's living in that space i mean she's vulnerable because of the superstorm but in terms of zoning you know there will be flexibility in place of um rebuilding for example you know this this wouldn't really apply in this situation but let's say there was a non-complying condition meaning that you know the use was technically not um not allowed but was legal because it was grandfathered in once an owner rebuilds the provisions would allow them to rebuild that non-complying space okay I, I got it i was probably being uh too much of a nudge about it because um i guess i guess carrie you'll have to run fast <laughs> well i guess honestly it's not just me though i mean it's it's the you know, there's a person like me in every building in this neighborhood. So I, I guess I am thinking what, what does that mean? So that, thank you, Betty, because I think that's a really good question. If there is, you know, damage, do, are we somehow out of a, a home? Sorry, I don't mean by the water, I mean by the, by the city and, and the, you know, being not allowed to rebuild or, or fix it. No, there, there are definitely, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the provisions that this new um, proposal is providing is in response to constraints that were seen after Sandy. Um, and the whole goal is to really provide property owners with more flexibility, um, sort of in the aftermath of a crisis or of a natural disaster. Okay, thank you, thank you, Nina. Um, Hector. Yeah, hi, um, Mabila. I, I guess my question is: uh, Well, I have one or two questions. I'll try to make it brief. Um, you're saying that some of the utilities, like the air conditioning units or the boiler units, will and some of these new constructions will be relocated to the roofs. Uh, would that also include new constructions like high rises that, um, like for example, 432 Park Avenue, where there was, they oversized these structures because they made a maintenance space in the middle smack in the middle of the building to accommodate those units. Wouldn't this leave an opening for that kind of situation again, that'll be blessed by this program because of the rezoning? Um, or is there somebody going to be looking at this more closely when they authorize these kind of uh, constructions? Sure. So um, that that wouldn't that wouldn't conflict with the residential mechanical voids rule that I think you're referencing, where um, city planning proposed a, had approved a text amendment that would address um, developers putting um, inflated mechanical spaces in the middle of buildings. So this would not, um, this would not recreate that risk because it's only allowing for um, mechanical uses to be located on rooftops. And the whole, the whole issue with the mechanical voids where developers were putting them in the middle of buildings was to prop up residential units. Um, and so when you're putting mechanical space on top, that's not, that's not really an issue. Um, so yeah, that, that wouldn't conflict with this. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Um, and my, I guess my next question is, let's, um, is the city gonna be assisting some of these homeowners, let's say if they do opt in? Because it sounds like it's, it's an optional thing, it's not mandatory. Is it gonna be optional for the existing buildings that are already here, they're gonna be grandfathered in as an exception or, and is it gonna be mandatory for new structures? Um, I guess my, uh, 
it's twofold. My question is that if it's going to be uh, in that situation scenario, but also the funding, are you going to be assisting somehow the uh, folks that have, that are homeowners with some of these conversions, if they're possible at all? Because we're dealing with some really old buildings here, some uh, historic landmarks, actually. Sure. So um, the so one part of your question in. Um, in addressing the um, the construction of buildings, this isn't this isn't mandated. This is this is optional. So if you have the funds to do it, you can pursue it and gain this flexibility um, to mitigate for flood risk. Um, in terms of providing funding or support. The Department of City Planning, do, we don't have the ability to do that. Um, I can look into um, agencies that would provide the support, um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any offhand. Yeah, the reason I brought that up is because uh, Harborview uh, Housing over in Brooklyn they uh, received a huge amount of money for, from FEMA after Hurricane Sandy hit. And they have converted a lot of their generators and boilers to the roofs with that money. And they've created floodgates and all sorts of scenarios on the grounds. So that's what I was wondering. I guess we would have to wait for a disaster hit and then possibly FEMA would step in and provide such funding. I mean, that's an option, I guess. So. I mean, I hate for that to be, you know, after the fact, but uh, I guess that is at least will be an option for some folks. Mm -hmm. I hope it is. Yeah, there, there was money given, you know, for after Superstorm Sandy. There was there was funding. Okay, Bert. Yeah, um, I'm just very confused, um, and I consider myself fairly you know, well-versed and I have an ability to read stuff and understand. I mean, I have a degree in city planning, but so what? Um, one, I mean, I also agree and I have some of the same reactions of my fellow um, committee members that this is generic. This is not anything specific to Chelsea, community board four. Um, and we all know that one size doesn't fit all. Rockaway Beach is not West Chelsea. West Chelsea is not Rockaway Beach. Um, it, this is not a nuanced piece of uh, proposal. This is not a nuanced proposal at all. Um, I also feel like Marty is like, this is a lot. How do we chop it up? How do we wrap around it? Um, and I still, in answer to um, Victor, uh, Hector's question, I didn't get a clear answer. What is mandatory and what is optional? Are you saying to us that everything you're putting out is optional? Optional both for new construction and optional both for uh, people who want to renovate. Because I remember city planning coming before us and maybe it was only those temporary uh, flood mitigation measures. But I remember it was optional for existing structures, but mandatory for new construction. And this doesn't seem to be placed in that same situation category. And, and it's like, you keep saying optionality and you're flexible and, but if we're trying to prevent damage from flooding, why is it optional? Certainly, why is it optional for new construction? I could see old, old buildings, maybe grandfathered in, you take your risk, like across the street from me, 24th Street, 25th Street, there's an underground stream that no one, of course, knew about until there was, you know, overflow. And the stream kept, had been buried for 120 years. And now we came up above the ground. Okay. So you take your risk. Um, but why is it, what's going on here? 
Okay, Bert, that's that's a good question for clarification. Can you uh, cover that, Mila? Yeah. So there's a, so there's two things. There's the building code appendix G, which is mandatory for both new buildings and substantial improvement improvements in existing buildings. Is that what we discussed two years ago or three years ago? No, so so what we discussed was the um, it was the uh, flood resiliency regulations that are temporary that are set to expire. And so this is an update to that. So the zoning regulations and Appendix G are separate. Appendix G is the building code and new buildings are required to meet those conditions. What we're talking about here are the zoning regulations that provide the flexibility needed to sometimes meet Appendix G rules on flood resiliency measures. So the building code does require, you know, fixed flood mitigation regulations. Um, and then the zoning resolution is providing further flexibility to help meet those um, particular rules in Appendix G. Because sometimes okay, that's, 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 flood... that's, that's good the way you explain it. It helps us to understand it better. So you're saying that Department of Buildings, their code G, Appendix G is mandatory and city planning is coming along with another layer, so to speak, saying that if you need some wiggle room from that mandatory, here's some options you could take. Is that the way it goes? Exactly. Yes. So that was that was what I was explaining in the the beginning of the presentation, um, and so um, once Jesse shares it, um, you'll be able to go back and and see those earlier slides. And I have a second question. Um, you had a couple of throwaway lines about and mitigate COVID or what is that about? Good, so, good, good, good question, Bert. That was my question that I've been sitting on. I don't quite, under, I too don't understand how yeah. COVID fits in this. So sure, the way that COVID fits into this is that um, part, of, part of this text the goal of this text is to um, help provide flexibility in these emergency response situations. So with um, the pandemic, um, there are two items that this proposal um, is seeking to help with in response sort of in the longer term. So one is giving more time for non-conforming uses to come back. For example, there may be a building with, um, with a non-conforming use. So a use that technically is not allowed by that zoning district, but has been grandfathered in. Um, typically when a use like that is vacated for two years, you can't bring that use back into play you have to rely on the existing zoning district rules. Um, and, you, and so that use is gone. It's no longer grandfathered. So um, the proposal gives more time um, for non-conforming uses to come back. And then two, we're giving more time for applications that came to the city planning commission that may be running out of the 10 year time limit to complete their plans of construction. So for example, if, some, if a developer came in for a special permit that the city planning commission approved um, and they haven't finished their construction within the 10 year time limit because of pandemic related delays, um, this will give them 
more time to complete construction. Okay. So it's important to note that the city is still operating under the mayor's emergency order. Um, and so these were the items that we identified that need more, that may need more time beyond what the emergency orders can give. Um, so city planning is taking the opportunity to add this flexibility now um, in the zoning for coastal flood resiliency since it's a citywide text amendment and is already going to all 59 community boards, borough presidents um, for review. Um, but we're continuing to monitor the pandemic to identify you know, what other items the city might need. Okay, thank, thank you. you. That, was, that, that was very clear. I, I know you said it in your slides, but it took a, takes a while to digest. Sure, there's a lot of information in the slides. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, I get it. It's, it's, it's an interesting twist. It's sort of at a different uh, level of discussion than all the rest of the text amendment. Yes. And would, would that be actually that's in the text amendment? In other words, you can read it if this gets approved, you can read it in the in the uh, zoning text. Yes. So the link I provided with the annotated text, if you if you peruse it, you'll you'll find that in there. Okay. Okay. Um, now I see Brad, you have your hand up, but uh, just before before I call on you, is there anyone who hasn't spoken who wants to speak? Paul? Uh, yeah, I just have a few questions. Uh, Nafila, can you, when you provide the map for the district for us with better clarification of where we're impacted, can you also provide um, the DFE height that you forecast for those areas? Um, because we, the question was asked about how much higher up a building could go gain, by gaining at this floor space at the ground and then adding height above. And I think it was 10 feet above DFE lines, but the DFE line might be 10 feet above where we are today. So that could be 20 feet of additional height. So to, to address the question of additional height, can you provide us a DFE line as well as clarification on the height added on after the building is built? You're muted, sorry. <laughs> I, um, sure, I'll, I'll provide that information. Um, but so in terms of the DFE line, um, basically, sorry, I'm just trying to find this slide where I showed that. While so, Nabila is finding her slide, I just want to point out that Jesse had to leave to go to a meeting for his child. And so um, Paul is our new host now. Um, all right, so uh, Nabila, I mean, I don't, I don't think necessarily, but you did say there was, there was an, in that graph, there was the uh, nine, 10, 12 foot height issues, and then you change it to 10 and five. But my question is, whether that's from a in increased height water line. So for example, Hudson Yards, um, if the water line there becomes uh, 20 feet high at the flood, and then we add 10 feet onto that, do they get to build 30 feet more onto each of their new towers that are coming in? Is that? No, so, um, so there, the height is measured from set, um, DFE lines. So, for example, um, the building height would be measured from a reference plane located. Um, so, if you're in one in one percent of the floodplain, the reference plane where you would begin to measure the height from is ten feet. So, you would measure from the grade ten feet. And then, so you would add 10 to the maximum height. So from current grade, you add 10 feet. It's not, is it not the new water line grade and then no. 10 feet up from that? No, it's from the current grade, 10 feet plus height. And then if you're in the point, 0 0.2% floodplain, it's from five feet. 
So, but from existing grade, not from, yes. okay, not from new waterline grade. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask about was the um, sort of protections in place for streetscape. Um, thinking about someone retrofitting a townhouse in Chelsea uh, and they build one of the, you, you had an image of a, a sea, almost a seawall in front of the property. And it, is there a height on those such that that seawall, if that's a 10 foot high wall in the 1% zone, and we have a whole series of 10 foot tall walls on our sidewalks, that's not gonna be a very um, comfortable neighborhood to live in. And so how, are the, how is the street scrape addressed in this? Sorry, let me see if I can um, share. If not, I have your presentation up and I can sh I might be able to share too. Okay. But if you look, if you're pulling yours up, it's on, pay, on slide um, 28. That's where I was. Right. Well, can you share it so we can all see it? Yeah, I, I, Nabil, I think Nabila is gonna try to share. If not, I can. Um, yep, I can Hold share. on a second. Um, let me see if I can do it. I can do it right now. I think I remember the visual on that. It was a little, a little, a rectangle, rectangular. This one here. Thing. There it is. That's it. So if all of Chelsea, every townhouse has one of these walls, and they're all ten feet tall. It will certainly change the dynamic of Chelsea. Well, how tall is that? That's, that's not ten feet, is it? No, that's what I'm. That's why I'm asking. How tall of these? No, so so the specifics of that are are in the text, and I'm sorry, I don't have. Um, have the the limit the height limit on those, um, but I can I can look into that and get back to you. But I I'm positive that that we would not be allowing ten foot well, going yeah, around. I mean, water if it, if the flood comes in and it's ten feet high and the wall is three feet tall, all those flood walls are just going to be overrun with water and all the water will go into those basements anyway, so they'll be useless, right? Like does that so. I'm trying to get some clarification on that particular point as well. Yeah, so you know, the, the point of this is that, you know, you can, as a building owner, you can find the, the design tools that you need that would make sense for your building to mitigate the flood risk. It's not that, you know, here are all the options and you can use all of these whether or not they make sense. Um, so it is, it is really about providing the flexibility for you to, to use these options in a way that makes sense for your building design. Okay, but that, that doesn't quite answer my concern that somebody, some building owner could say, for my sensibility and my safety of my property, I wanna build a 10 foot tall wall to protect from a 10 foot flood. So there's no there's no 10 foot tall wall that's permitted. <laughs> um, but I can I can So you can confirm what maybe you can confirm the the wording that would prevent a 10 foot pole wall. Um, I also when I saw this I had a reaction to it myself at least in our neighborhoods in in Chelsea where I, low 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 rise housing you know maybe this is a big apartment building i don't know but it it, it would stick out, stick out like a sore thumb in mo much of our neighborhoods yeah I, again uh, to follow up on that the, the graphs that you presented on the front porches and the stoops and the winding staircases um don't necessarily can't be necessarily addressed in chelsea we can't have winding long porches and stoops so the point system that you have for Rockaway Beach is not a point system that I think can work here in Chelsea. Yes, that's that's true. I mean, there there are different options in the point systems, and so some may not be able to be utilized in certain areas of the city. It's just, um, you know, I know I know people are upset that you know this is a sort of more general presentation um, that applies citywide, but it is, you know, for informational purposes, there are some things that won't apply um, in CB4 just because of the building stock that exists there. 
Okay. Um, those are my two immediate concerns. Okay. I'm concerned about mechanical void height, but that's been discussed. Concerned about impact on historic districts. Um, and there are some questions in the Q&A box, Betty, from Chris LeBron. Do we want to bring him in? Do you want me to bring him in or do you want me to just ask his questions? Well, we do also have uh, a blue Brad's hand hands. up for... Uh, Twee and Brad's we, hands are up. Now, so, yeah. Why don't we get to her hand and then to, to Chris? Okay, I'll bring, I'll bring him over then as a panelist. Just like everybody else, I have many questions, but I'll only limit it to one. Um, the slide that you had there, also when you scrolled up a little bit, I noticed that they talked it was a little bit about the waterfront and that seemed to be a little cursory um, in talking about um, the waterfront and there was a picture with all the rocks there. Um, it brings to mind for me the movie, the Spike Lee movie, When the Levees Broke from Hurricane Katrina. Instead of having to do all of this building type remediation, so to speak, why not have any sort of levees that surround even maybe just that waterfront? or something similar to that. That part wasn't really clear. Could, could you just repeat that a little bit? I, I lost some of it. I, okay. I got the waterfront. Why can't we have, and then I got lost. Levees. Levees, levees. Like it makes me think of the movie uh, when the levees broke having to do with Hurricane Katrina and Spike Lee where you could have uh, something along that waterfront, that particular waterfront presentation part was a little cursory. It wasn't clear what limitations there were to doing something similar to that versus having to do individual optional remediation on buildings. That's a, a that's a, a big U question or similar to it. I don't know what big U is. Uh, Wait, let's... I'm just making an association for those who know, who know Twee and I'll tell you about it anytime you want. Okay. So let's go ahead. So this is, this is something, so zoning for coastal flood resiliency is focused on zoning lots, building stock, and things that owners can address on their sites. In terms of levies and things like that, that's not something under the purview of the Department of City Planning. And so that's why it's not written into this proposal. These are initiatives that other agencies may be looking into, um, but it's not something that's relevant to this proposal. This is about what, what flexibility do building owners have in order to meet Appendix G building code standards when required. Um, so, so that that's kind of outside of the, the scope of this particular proposal. That's not to say that the city isn't looking into, you know, larger flood resiliency measures citywide, but this is, this is strictly about the zoning resolution um, related to the city's building stock. But just, just as a follow up on, on that, because it was a good question, um, for the waterfront, it was a very brief mention. It, it seemed like it was a different topic than all the stuff about buildings. No, so um, so for the waterfront, when um, when a property owner has a waterfront yard um, or is required to have visual corridors to the waterfront. Um, there, there isn't really much um, flood risk regulation that or options that exist today. Um, and because many sites require um, owners to provide public access using mm -hmm. specific design standards, um, there isn't much flexibility to accommodate best resiliency practices mm -hmm. through those design standards. So the proposal would offer more flexibility for the grading of the site. So being able to, to create public spaces by the waterfront at higher grades um, and you know, would allow um, them to facilitate resiliency measures um, such as soft shorelines. Okay, okay, that, that kind of links it to 
why it's there, I guess. In other words, it's relating to property owners who are near the waterfront. Uh, maybe in the future, it could be sort of clarified a little bit more that that's the tie-in. Anyway, it's not a big deal. Um, I think uh, somebody who hasn't spoken is Christopher. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, ju just one. I was, I was kind of curious as to whether or not um, the community board's NYCHA campuses fall into this expanded 1% flood zone. Yeah, so actually um, parts of Chelsea Elliott and Fulton houses fall into the 0.2% flood zone. As it stands now or in this proposed uh, change? In this, in this proposal. Okay, and so um, if, if any of these campuses were to flip over to like Red Pack, I know that there are larger conversations to make sure that it doesn't, but let's say hypothetically it does. Um, would these new campus and building managers um, have a say to activate this coastal flood zone uh, plan? And would that, uh, has that been put into consideration as to the loss of section eight housing when section nine housing is transferred over um, from NYCHA to Red Pack? Um, so, I mean, any, I guess the answer is yes, in terms of any building owner, including NYCHA, could opt into these regulations. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I mean, it kind of does. It, it just kind of said, it tells me that if we, if NYCHA were to move any, or the mayor were to move any of these properties over to Red Pack, that a developer would be able to trigger this uh, coastal resiliency zoning uh, to do what they please with those buildings to meet G. And G seems like, you know, a, a bit of a convenience for them. Just, just to clarify, Chris, Christopher, um, if RAD or PACT or any of those things go through, the housing authority continues to own the property. So it's just a good thing. To yes, but, but the money is put, uh, the money spent on maintenance is through the management company in RAD PACT. Uh, so we can, I, we can debate sure that later. You, I'm not sure what you mean by Appendix G being convenient for them. Appendix G has pretty strict flood resiliency requirements for new buildings or buildings that will be substantially altered. And so that's something that's quite costly and, um, and is purely meant to address flood resiliency requirements that the building code has laid out. So I don't, I'm not sure that this would, um, this would trigger yeah. a negative so, impact. My, my large concern is just tenant protections under section nine versus tenant protections under section eight and whether or not we would be losing houses potentially something like this, that's all. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Now we've got Brad and Marty that want to talk or ask a question. But before that, is there anyone else? Don't be shy if you have a question that uh, you want to ask at this point that we don't forget anybody and I didn't notice you, no? Okay, so then we'll take Marty and then we'll take Brad. Just, I just wanna say uh, quickly that uh, to uh, Twee's, Twee's question and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Nabila knows the big U is a proposed series of, of barriers along the shoreline that go from approximately 59th Street on the west side to 42nd Street on the east side. I'm not sure that I have the streets accurate, but you get the idea. Some of the projects are already occurring on the lower east side to create uh, onshore and offshore barriers for storms. As I said before, none of them, they're, they're, they're envisioned, but none of them are actively being talked about in our district. So there is a discussion about storm barriers along the edge of Manhattan. The slide that Nabila showed, of course, was from the Brooklyn side and uh, soft, 
soft edges make sense there. Soft edges don't make sense in, in our uh, soft water edges, don't make sense in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Appreciate it. Now I see by the visual, it looks like a U. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. Probably, I would imagine there are other agencies in the city who are sinking their teeth into that topic as compared to city planning, right? My gut, my yeah. gut says that Waterfront and Parks needs to, they, they, they spoke with us some years ago and they need to come back at some point so that we can uh, get ourselves refreshed on the state of what's going on. Good point. So, Good point. So what Marty's talking about is part of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Plan. That's correct. Um, but, you know, aside, aside from the sort of more um, regional types of large plans to address this, you know, this is, this proposal is really meant to provide these smaller um, fixes and options for property owners in these floodplains. Okay, thank you. All right, Brad. That's just a clarification. I know you said in open spaces, it would allow what the, the city to put in generators and backup batteries. And what does that mean? Does that mean a park? I'm just trying to understand. I mean, in Chelsea, it's not like there's open lots. Where, where would they put these things? Um, so it wouldn't be in parks. It would be in if there's open space on the zoning lot itself. OK, I, I get that. You get that, Brad? Yeah, so they're saying you could put a, a generator on the ground, even though they keep telling you it's got to be off the, the floodplain. So I'm trying to understand that. So he's asking how, how could it be on the lot when if you're in the floodplain, wouldn't that generator be threatened by the storm surge? I mean, I think it, it depends on how, how exactly the generator or batteries or, or um, whatever power system is there is, is built. So presumably it would be flood protected in some way. Okay, flood protected somehow, okay. Okay, um, Paul, you got any more questions? No, I think that. No, so I think I think we're. Um, Brad, I still see your little. Oh, I, little, I can take his hand down. Sorry. Okay, just be sure everybody's got got their uh, two cents in. A lot, a lot, a lot of good comments and questions. Um, so what we can do is try to get a vote saying approve or not approve or with conditions one way or the other, and this is what we want. It does occur to me that the uh, comment period goes to December 28th. It's possible we could talk about this again in December and then finalize that, or is that too painful? <laughs> I mean, I think that I'd like to, I'd like to try to tackle uh, Marty's question at the outset of like, what exactly um, are we trying to do here? And Jesse's thoughts were that we would like a similar pass when these citywide issues come up is propose a denial of the of the zoning text amendment unless these conditions are included. And then we have a list of issues that we as community board four want to make sure are included. I for one would like to hear more and see more that's specific to Chelsea, <clears throat> specific specifically to the historic portions of Chelsea. Totally so, agree. So we could have that as an issue that we want to see. I, I was also thinking 
maybe there could be a couple of examples mm -hmm. of the types of buildings that are typical in Chelsea and what would be one or two or three options for them and what would it look like? Because um, I'm a visual person. Um, anyway, we could, we could write up something like that as well. So we would need, so a big issue is, is wanting a, de a, a detailed map or better map of community district four and the floodplain boundaries, right? Right, right, the floodplain and, and you know, kind of like the idea that maybe there could be a couple of examples of how the proposed text would impact. Um, and I would have the answer to that. The question that came up about have you been communicating with LPC, what, what, has, what have those conversations been like in terms of how they're helping point this in the right direction to protect historic districts? Well, or historic districts. Well, can I add one more thing to that? Sure, Vera. Yeah. The, I was waiting for you to say something. <laughs> You've been awful quiet. <laughs> well, there's a lot, but anyway, I think uh, what, what Nabila is presenting is more sort of generic and sort of a citywide. Uh, and the, um, it's typically what you encounter when there's a change in zoning text. Uh, my, que my question to Mr. Just addition for the LPC, has else, will LPC or any other city agency um, sort of tailor their guidelines or their regulations in light of what is being proposed in the zoning text. Something that we, I'm, I'm, I'm not framing it very well, but what I'm saying is that these conversations must have been translated into some sort of changes at the LPC. Would they be issuing some different set of guidelines for? Well, that's certainly an issue we can raise. Yeah. Is there any other agency that you would be thinking of? Yeah, LPC is one, and my chair is another one, obviously. Um, I mean, multiple agencies, right? DEP, definitely, because there is a CSO issue that sort of ties back into um, flooding mitigation. So there are multiple how about, agencies. How about HPD? Um, HPD yeah, is, a, is a large, large own, uh, they have a large ownership of housing, definitely. I also. So there might be some ways of understanding how this various agencies would change their best practices based on the proposals that are being made. And, and to HPD, I would also add, as Kerry was raising the point of displaced garden basement residents, if an owner retrofits a building to make it resilient to storms and that garden basement tenant is kicked out, where what options are the, do, do we have available for those displaced residents? Yeah, and one last comment that I want to make is that we're talking about blocking the drains while the floodgates are wide open. So how but, does- Baron, could you, could you do me a favor and talk a little slower? Because I'm taking I, notes. I, I have to remember. I, to can't, I can't write as fast as you talk. No, what I was saying is that we're we, we kind of discussing um, blocking the drains while the floodgates are wide open. So how does this change of uh, text and resolution get tied into larger sort of mitigation and plant retreat scenarios that city is considering or the sea level rise and you know, so the waterfront, adaptive waterfront um, guidelines that are being discussed at the city planning. How are these different pieces getting tied together? And that is not clear from this presentation at all. I, I think I got it. I think I, think I got it. I think um, Marty was next. Marty, Marty, then David, then Bart. It's, it's also probably uh, not clear, just to pick up from what you were saying, Varen, not clear in the text uh, of the zoning amendment as well, because zoning amendments don't, are usually not written speaking to other agencies. Um, Paul, I, I hope we don't write it the way you suggested. I think that it's far, far too complex. Uh, and I think we sh our letter should start out that we neither deny nor approve the zoning, uh, the zoning text amendments. However, we have these concerns. Mm -hmm. And the one we just heard is certainly one of them. All right, well, I, I personally um, think that if we, we, since this is a comment period and there is going to be a zoning text amendment passed, um, I would propose that we do in fact take a position one way or the other because to say we're not in favor nor opposed, but here are our issues. I'd rather say we deny, but
but we want to make sure these issues in our our neighborhood are, are addressed because it's I, going to go forward. I don't, I don't mind that wording, but I mind we deny unless these are addressed. No, oh, all right. Yeah, we'll find a way to word it. That's because if we address, if we say unless these are addressed, then by the time they are addressed, we approve the zoning uh, the zoning amendment. And there's so much more in the zoning amendment than any of our comments can address. So. That's I think we're right. Go ahead. So how how would we how would we word it then, Marty? Paul, I use Paul's language. We we deny the zoning text amendments. However, we have these concerns. Oh, okay. Just take out a, unless. However, mm -hmm. however, we have these concerns. Mm -hmm. That's okay. that's much more. I mean that. Okay, got we, it. We haven't looked at all the things that we. We can't look at all, all of the issues in the zoning text amendment. It's far too complex. And we haven't had it targeted to our district as many of the questioners have said. So even denying and then giving concerns is a probably, probably a stronger position than we wanna take because there may be a whole lot of good stuff in there that we haven't been yeah. able to look at. We're just, we, yeah, not much of it is for other districts, so. Right. We can only we can only talk for our district, so I think it's a good compromise to, to take up your suggestion. Viren, did you want to say something else on that? No, I was just going to suggest that if you want to be constructive and say these are our concerns and come back to us with some clarifications, that might be a way to sort of find a common ground to be able to approve or disapprove. But you know, giving DCP a chance to come back and explain to us how how our concerns can be addressed. I, I think that would be, I personally think that's a good idea to see, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it, it, it to come back, it would help us if they could come back fairly quickly with uh, addressing some of our concerns and, and asking for, excuse me, information. So that would be, that would be very, very helpful to us. Right, and, and that is the reason why I'm saying it, and uh, you know, DCP will not be working in, you know, in vacuum. So I'm sure there have been many coordinations between various agencies, and there might be some of these answers. Some of these answers might already exist, so we might just. It might be. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Let's hey. let's let's go in the order that we had told everybody: David, Bert, then Pamela. David. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not as optimistic as Viren about landmarks kind of talking to city planning. In my experience, landmarks just likes to uh, draw up close borders and uh, and limit their involvement uh, in things. And you know, in my experience, developers will come before landmarks and talk about the addition to their historic row house and say it's all within what uh, zoning allows in terms of FAR. And that makes it sound, you know, it's even less than what zoning allows, even though what they've done is to lower the English basement so that it doesn't count as FAR. And they're adding on in a way that is, uh, it's not uh, appropriate for the neighborhood and they just point to the zoning and it makes them look great. Um, I, even before this meeting, I was thinking we might wanna suggest to city planning uh, zoning text amendment that would, within historic districts, remove the option of lowering an English basement level so that it no longer counts toward FAR, uh, which is the opposite of the direction that this is going in. So I would definitely propose a carve out for historic districts, and maybe this is an opportunity to say that people who lower the basement level so that it becomes technically uh, a seller and doesn't contribute to FAR, that that shouldn't be allowed anymore because you know within this floodplain, it's actually making the building more susceptible. In the case of the oldest house in Chelsea, not only was the developer gonna lower the English basement level so that it wouldn't count as zoning, but put in an entire level below that that would go back to within six feet of the rear property line for the full width. Um, I'm, not this is, I'm not reading are, this. I'm not reading this zoning text manual as allowing that sort of activity, David. So let's let's get some clarification on that. No, what it would do is say that uh, you don't have to count uh, your bottom floor as FAR, if I'm not wrong. 
that it is, is, but, that, it, but that's the same. That, but I think that you're conflating the issues here, and that the 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 reduction, the increase of basement height in historic districts does not count as FAR. These buildings, it still does not count as FAR. So if they're if it's already a basement that they dig out, it doesn't count as FAR. If they're making it more resilient, and no, the English basement point, counts yeah. as FAR. It does because the average height of its volume is above sidewalk level. That's why we're constantly getting these proposals where they're lowering the English basement by two feet so that its average height falls below sidewalk level and it's no longer counting toward FAR. Then they put that FAR on the back of the building and we lose, we lose the, the backyard space. Let's, let's and it's, it's uh, fundamentally unsustainable because it contributes to urban high, heat island effect in addition. So maybe, maybe, like maybe this is an opportunity for within the historic districts to go in a different direction and say, no more of this uh, giving yourself an FAR bonus by digging out the cellar, which doesn't make sense in a floodplain. So and we, in, we incorporate clarify, that change. Can I clarify go ahead, Nabila. What, the, what this proposal is allowing? So the proposal is allowing the first 30 feet of a space that is dry flood proofed. So it has to be dry flood proofed to be exempted from floor area. And provided that the space is used for non-residential uses. So this is really geared towards um, spaces that have like ground floor commercial use or you know a doctor's office. This isn't allowing this isn't allowing anything more than what's already happening in the historic the historic brownstones. So let's say I have one of these row houses and I've got an English basement and I've got a tenant in there. Um, could I simply dry waterproof that uh, that basement area, move the tenant out? Uh, and create a rear addition. Uh, and um, that rear addition could fall within the extra FAR gained by my new treatment of the basement. Well, no, because this is for non-residential uses. And typically those houses are located in purely residential districts. So you're not gonna have a non, it's all residential use. Okay, so that, that clears so no. that up. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's go, uh, Bert, Pam, and then Carrie. Bert. Yeah, um, all, you know, all the incentives here to implement the proposed zoning changes, the changes by the, the, the sustainability, the flood prevention changes are physical and um, there's no, and it, maybe it's the wrong fiscal environment even to think about this, but to uh, have this attached to some kind of program, low cost loans, low interest loans or something um, that would provide an incentive to implement the changes. Um, so as I'm talking, this has nothing to do with city planning. <laughs> yeah, OMB. Um, yeah, and you know, this is not the environment. All right. But I just, right. I just, so let's go to Pam. That's it. That's the move on. Let's move in the right place. Okay. Thanks, Bert. Okay. Um, what David said, basically, uh, in part, but I'd be interested to know uh, what other uh, community boards that have large historic districts if they've already had this conversation and what conclusions they've drawn particularly CB2 and one would be interesting for us to know I would think um, what's what their thinking is and they probably would like to know what our thinking is about this um, I like to think that there could be some sort of carve out for uh, as has been discussed for historics uh, not just ours uh, on this subject. Um, I think the, the, the discussion about the, the berm um, 
uh, the you, the great giant you, um, is is a worthwhile conversation to have because if that's done and successful, then all of this conversation is moot. It seems to me, and I don't think 59th Street on the Hudson is is uh, it, it doesn't need to go that far. I don't think that. I think it's just up as far as about 35th Street or so. Uh, the Manhattan's elevations are higher further north. Um, we're the most vulnerable and the village, obviously, and, and, and CB1. Anyway, that's, that's my thought. I've, is there some possible way to carve out those districts? Um, I can see that if this happens and these zoning changes take place, this is basically the end of historic districts as we know them. The faces, the, the developers will indeed take advantage of every possible loophole that there will be. Um, and we need to be very cautious about that. That's all I've got. But Can I you know, clarify I... the historic district situation? So the historic districts, the only way a building could take advantage of these options is if they are significantly renovating their building within the historic district, because that would then trigger the building code appendix G requirements exactly. to meet flood resiliency standards. If you're already at that level of substantially altering your building to trigger those building code requirements, then you can take advantage of these options here. You can't just be like, oh, I, I want an extra, I want a penthouse in my historic district building, I can use these rules. No, this is, you are substantially altering your historic district building, meaning you're already going to LPC, you're already filing building permits, where DOB will tell you, you have to meet flood resiliency requirements noted in Appendix G. Once you look at Appendix G and you see, oh, I need to meet all of these requirements and I need a little bit of flexibility to be able to do that, then I go to this, these new provisions that give me the flexibility to meet those rules. You cannot use anything that I presented today as of right in a historic district without substantially altering your building, which means you're already going through some kind of review process at LPC, at DOB. All right, I'd like to um, suggest- If, if I may just, Harry, just jump in, because I, I would like to Harry, follow Harry directly on that because thought. Because we do have another agenda item. So- we, we Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief. But Thanks. you know, Nabila, what happens in Chelsea is that people buy these houses and they demolish everything but the front facade. They do go to Landmarks, they do go to DOB and they, they put in completely new buildings behind the historic facade uh, according to existing zoning. And oh, you know bigger. they, they work with the, the basement levels to get the maximum zoning they can. But it sounds like what you said earlier was that uh, the flexibility that they get from the zoning resolution would apply only in cases where they're no longer uh, talking about residential space. So they would not be able to increase their FAR, for example, if the building was still entirely residential. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Well, that's a good clarification. But there are, there are other flexibility options that I presented that they could potentially use, but only if they have triggered Appendix G requirements of the building code. So there's right, like... The one there's a lot of pieces here. The piece that you initially were talking about, about the English basements, the, the 30 foot rule of dry flood proofed um, uses within the first 30 feet of a space that can be exempted from floor area does not apply to residential uses. So that could not be that could not be utilized even if the building was being substantially altered and triggered Appendix G. Okay. 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 And the only other consideration is that the height, the height limit might change. It might that would be elevated 
Yeah, because it's yes, based on the, the building decided to if they needed to elevate because of the floodplain, then yes, they would have flexibility in their height to address that. Okay, thank you. All right, let's do Carrie and then let's see if we can get Betty can do a summary um, and see if we can't wrap this up some. So Sorry, I'm not sure if this will be very eloquent, but I'm just wondering if there's some language we can ask for that protects buildings or residential buildings probably mostly that where people it's just not an option it's just simply not an option to to create what you guys are suggesting and i think that goes back to the opt-in opt-out like not really sure you know whether you have to or don't have to but that no no penalty will be applied if you can't that makes I, sense i i i think that nabila correct me if i'm wrong have just clarified that the issue on the lower level is talking about non-residential buildings. Correct, Nabila? So, so it's, it's not your case. So only non-residential buildings. Uh, uh, am I right? So, so the, the concern that David brought up about the English basements being able to um, not count towards floor area, that, that is not true. That does not happen through these provisions. But these provisions apply citywide to residential and non-residential and mixed use buildings within the 1% and 0.2% floodplain. So then, uh... I would renew the request that if it's impossible to comply somehow without displacing people that um, there's no penalty for that building. Is there some kind of grandfathering? I, I'm not sure I, I understand that question. Well, for example, somebody brought up flood insurance, which, you know, I think is probably the responsibility of the homeowner, but that is an increased risk in living in an apartment that is sub, you know, a garden apartment, which is how we always refer to it. But let's just say that there's a flood. I want to make sure that residents who do live in garden apartments in Chelsea, which are all throughout Chelsea, are not going to be penalized if they need assistance from the city, for example. I mean, the zoning can't control flood insurance rates. And right. I mean, the second piece. No, but I, let me see if I can, Carrie, let me see if I can help phrase this in a way that, so if a building owner has a garden basement apartment um, and they get slapped with new flood insurance rates, and unless they meet some sort of flood resiliency requirements to reduce their insurance, they come in and say, all right, we're going to make this, this basement um, Flood resistant. We're going to use these resili resiliency rules. It's going to create a vacant space, um, and the garden basement apartment tenant is now pushed out. And is there I any mean, protection I, there? I mean, we're talking about the safety of New Yorkers. So if there's a storm event and New Yorkers are harmed in garden level apartments because they're in the floodplain, I'm not really sure how the zoning could provide protection when what we're trying to do is protect people from these natural disasters. Does, Carrie, does that help address your question better? Um, not really. Oh, I mean, I, I'm not sure how to, no, I appreciate that. I don't know if I'm phrasing it correctly, but it feels like- um, It feels like a no. Well, and it feels like there are, you know, these construction issues that just don't necessarily apply to many of the buildings that are in our our district. So I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I know how to under how to so process I, this. Maybe I, maybe I understand a little better now. So whatever doesn't apply to CB4 just doesn't apply. The, the, these are these are options that are triggered when you have to meet Appendix G building code requirements. So if you're in CB4 and you are building a new development or you're significantly altering an existing building and DOB says, okay, you have to meet Appendix G requirements. You just go ahead and you meet those requirements, but you can use these provisions 
that I presented in a like pick and choose what's applicable to your site that will help you meet Appendix G to do so. So there's no penalty if you're not using something that doesn't apply in your district. You just can't, it's physically impossible, doesn't make sense, isn't cost effective. So you're, you're, this is kind of like a menu of options that's triggered when you're required to meet Appendix G building code requirements. So I guess that from, I'm slow on this myself. So, so if, if the owner significantly plans to alter the building, significant alteration, they have to use G, G they might be able to use some options that are in the proposed text amendment, right? Yes, because sometimes what happens is, for example, um, you know, Appendix G says you need to elevate your building because you're in the 1% flood risk right. zone right. Right. and we need your building to be safe and resilient. And then you look at, you know, your zoning regulations and you know zoning you know there's a height cap or what have you there's a limit and you can't elevate your building without compromising some floor area that you need to sort of recoup your investment in a resilient building then you're going to be able to use the the rule that gives you the 10 feet additional flexibility to elevate your building and still use the floor area you're allowed in that. The concern, just to make it basic, the concern of Kerry is, would any of the options result in the tenants in the garden apartments to be thrown out? Could they? Is it, is it, is it likely or is it totally unlikely? Do we have to worry about that? I don't think so, unless there's an actual storm that harms these people living in garden apartments. That's that's about as much as I can say on that. Well, maybe we can raise it as an issue to highlight it. And since it's a little iffy and we can put it in our, in our letter. Um, let's, so Paul, I'm going to do my best here, okay? It sounds like, Betty, your initial uh, uh, initial reaction is we may need to come back to this in December. Well, so, we're gonna, we're gonna so we have to decide, are we going to write a letter now or, or what? I mean, it seems to me we're on a roll here. I don't know, while the issues are fresh, we can write a letter and there's and if DCP comes back and clarifies certain things better for us, or if we understand it more, or they change a regulation, then we can say, oh, okay, we feel comfortable about X, Y, and Z. We could write a second letter, right? What well, I don't know, what do you think? This is sounding like Gansevoort all over again, Betty. <laughs> oh, don't do that. Let's, let's not do that. <laughs> So what? Do you, so so shall we do this then? Do this letter? No. I, I would. I would like to have them back back yeah. another time with much more specific. But we have. But if we don't write some kind mm -hmm. of a letter, maybe it's not a vote letter, but we have to write some kind of letter saying we want to know about X, Y, Z. Right. So the, so the question is, do we want to make a request to DCP for further information? that is specific to community district four, and we can list the few things that we've discussed right. Right. and then address those at our December meeting and then write the letter for community board approval at the December meeting. We uh, could do that, but I think we have to write something down. And I would, I would prefer to have something in front of me written to discuss our position. And right. I'm okay. not sure what you're saying, Bert. I, I I'm understand. saying, you know, I, I like I like that timeline. Let's come back. But when we come back, I would like some kind of proposed letter from us as not so much from Department of City Planning, because they're, they're not going to change too much. 
but I, I would like some reaction from them on our specifics. But I would like from us, from you guys, something, a proposed letter that we're gonna send to the full board. Right, well, so I think- We have so, a framework. So Bert, you're, you're saying the steps are to request from DCP information on the concerns about the historic district, the heights issues, the streetscape issues, the displacement issues. Yes. Get that information from them. Then Betty and I draft a letter incorporating that information to present at the next meeting to this committee to vote on it at that point. And I would suggest we circulate it ahead of time as well yes. and have input on it. But right, I would clarifying. ask that we also ask for information about how this might impact the special West Chelsea zoning district, which was so carefully uh, sculpted. You know, the impact on the skyline, the relationship between that district and the adjacent historic district, because okay. all of that stuff is within this area of concern. And it would be great if we maybe could see diagrams showing what the impact would be there, as opposed to in a generic New York location or a Brooklyn or Queens right. beachfront location. So, so let's just let's just clarify. So, so we write a letter to city planning, um, saying highlighting these issues and impact questions. And, but it's not a denial or approval or an arrest or whatever. It's a request this for is, more information. This is a request for more information, and that that to help us make a more uh, informed decision at our December meeting. Right. And right. a better map. Oh, I got that on the list. Yeah, we have. But, but, but what, what that would mean is that mid-December, they come back and they tell us what we want to hear. Hopefully that, before that. Even before, before that. Okay, so it's not going to wait until the next committee meeting. It might happen before then. Correct. There, well, there, I think it should so, be in our early, early December, so we could digest. Uh, poor Nabila, you're going to have to go back to your boss and say they, they want all this stuff. Um, that early December, so then we can digest it, and then we can not have such a long meeting. <laughs> right, right. What, I'm, what I was trying to say is that taking the letter back, approval letter back to uh, the full board meeting might not happen in December. Am I right? No, it would. Well, one way or the other, we would have a position and we take it to the full board. Oh. Or we can take oh, it no. to exec. Oh, it, can right. go to ex it can go to exec we at the end of December. Yeah. Uh, Marty, you had another question? No, I'm trying to, uh, thank you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to process this. I, I, my original thought, and then the calendar got in my way, was that Betty has uh, the idea of a letter, and I would like to see that letter sent as soon as possible. That, does, that means that it can't be uh, approved by the full board uh, because that would take too long to send out. Uh, I wonder if we could send out uh, an, a, an administrative letter soon. Is that the plan? Send out an administrative letter asking, listing all the points that we've made. It's just like you're writing a letter, but you make it an administrative letter and then get the answers to that. Uh, the sooner the better. If those answers could be brought to the full board in December, that would be lovely, but it doesn't feel like that would be possible. Time is wrong, too short. Uh, I would suggest the very same thing, Marty. It's an administrative letter right. questionnaire. And and I don't know the process as well as you guys. You've been around longer than me and, and Bert, you could certainly address this. The administrative letter, immediately do an administrative letter requesting more information. That information is given to us. Betty and I will work on a draft letter um, that we would then circulate to the committee in advance of the December meeting. At the December meeting, we would discuss the letter, which would have incorporated the information we received from DCP. That hinges on your getting the information back soon enough for that process to work. Indeed. Oh, but we're, does, and, we're, then, we're talking about our December meeting, the committee's December meeting, not the full board. Oh, I want to oh, make that okay. clear. But then we wouldn't make the deadline of- We'll December make the deadline because it can go to exec and exec it would have to go to it. exec. It would have to go to exec. Okay, I think we got it. Has everybody <laughs> got it? We, uh, yeah. we uh, let me Paul and I do this administrative letter, all, all these issues we've that have been raised. I think the two of us took notes. Then hopefully city planning comes back. And then at our Chelsea Land Use Committee meeting, we, uh, based on the new information, we, we write a letter that says denial unless or whatever, or concerns, continued, continued concerns. And then that goes to exec. 
so that it can get to city planning by the 28th. And it would right? go to the full board in January. In January. The only for ratification. For ratification. The only, the only wrinkle that I, I would like to hear some consideration about is I, I don't, I, I'm, I, I don't mean to insult the speaker today. Um, the city planning isn't going to get back to us quickly enough in a month in order for us to consider this month. This well, Marty, month. that's their problem. If they don't get back to us, then we know what we're going to do. It's their and problem. If they don't get back to us, you're saying I'm just I'm just putting it on the table. If they don't come back to us by our December meeting, then in our December meeting, we're basically writing the same letter that says we can't approve this. Because we don't have any, enough information. They didn't respond. It's, 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 and we'll be very clear about it. We want to cooperate. And we assume city planning and, wants and Nabil, to cooperate Nabil with us. Spent well. an hour, two hours getting drilled by us. And I'm sure, and she's got 50 of these boards she's got to do. So I I'm hope sure. she, you're not, not the one well, going like, to all I the boards. To do this is just, I'm all yours. I'm all CB4. So I've taken notes as well. And, you know, I will get as much information as I possibly can um, to you before, before the next meeting. Great. Right. I, I have full confidence in you, Nabila. You will do it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, what about you? Now? Can we move on? What about I think, Clinton I think Clinton Clinton Chris went had dinner board. and came back already. Hmm? All right. What so, about Clinton's the, Hell's Kitchen Board? I mean, are they weighing in? I honestly don't know. I don't know. I have to check with Jesse on that. I think they have no good. flooding up there. Yeah. I think it impacts our, our portion of the district bigger, but um, I'm also a member of Health Kitchen Land Use, so I can maybe do a presentation to them and see if we can get some input from them to incorporate into our letter. So, so just, um, I don't wanna go over the whole thing all over again. So Paul and I will work on this administrative letter. You give us your trust on that and we'll show it to you after at some, you know, when we've read it, we should, it's 10 of nine. And we have one more item to go. All right. It looks like everyone's nodding their heads or giving thumbs up. So we're going to move on to agenda item number two. Thank you, Nabila. Thank, Thank you, Nabila. Appreciate Thank it. Very, we'll talk to you soon. very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nabila. All right. Um, so item number two, I've lost my agenda on my screen. So I'm going to have to it's, just. Oh, do you want me to read it? But, but, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, 217 7th Avenue Physical Culture Establishment, Mind Body Project, Meditation and Fitness Establishment. So um, this is a PC application, basically a gym. Uh, Betty and I did go on a tour of the facility. Um, we have Jay Goldstein here, who is the attorney representing Chris Stockel, who is the um, entrepreneur. And so Jay, we're gonna leave it up to you. And if you give a presentation, you can share a screen. Yes, I can try. Let's see. All right. And if not, I can pull it up too. Let me know if that worked out. Well, it works. I can see it. it works because I cannot see it. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, so good good evening, Jay Goldstein for the applicant. I uh, will try and keep it short. I'm here tonight uh, for a PC on behalf of uh, Mind Body Project and Chris Stockel. The proposed uh, PC is at 217 7th Avenue. The building itself is a six story mixed use building, ground floor commercial, residential above. Um, the building has frontage on, on 7th Avenue, which is where our space would be located, and it runs between West 22nd and West 23rd along the east side of 7th Avenue. Hey, Jay, sorry to interrupt. Can you uh, zoom out or in on your screen? Because all we're seeing is some white, it's the top left corner of your map. Is that centered? No, it's no. not centered. We're not seeing. Um, I don't know why, so hang on a second. I'm not sure. So maybe Paul, you want to try and share it and see if it works better? Uh, sure, I'll try to see if I can do it. So go ahead and keep talking and I'll see if I can pull it up. Let me see one more time and see if it works. Um, that's, better. that's better. That's better. Okay, so give me one second. I just unhooked my second monitor. Okay, so again, the space is uh, located on 7th Avenue at the ground floor of the building, which spans between West 22nd and West 23rd Street. Um, the Application for the gym is required based on city zoning, which mandates that all gyms have to come for a special permit before the community board and the board of standards and appeals. The building, as I mentioned, is a six is a six-story mixed-use building. 
The space that you see over here with the roll down gate is the location of the space, which is currently still under construction. Um, Mind Body Project is a new concept in, in uh, physical fitness group classes. The, uh, it, it focuses on a holistic wellness uh, combining meditation and functional training. So you'll have 50 minute classes. The classes will start with 10 minutes of meditation, 30 minutes of body weight yoga and TRX, which I'll show you in a minute, and 10 minutes of meditation and stretching. There's no free weights, there's no machines, there are no bicycles. This is really just a mellow environment um, focusing on meditation, focusing on wellness. The space itself, or the, the space itself, you'll see you enter along 7th Avenue into this area. This is a reception area and a waiting area. Over here, there's this little area is a very cool hammock um, where people can hang out and wait for their classes. Since this is a class only gym, you won't have people working out as a in, a in an open gym environment. So they'll be there just immediately before and immediately after classes. As you walk further into the space, here's a locker room with uh, handicap accessible toilets, um, bathrooms. And then you walk further in, these are the showers, this is a handicap accessible shower and changing areas within the shower and changing area outside um, in a communal area. The studio itself, the, the space itself has one studio. It can accommodate a maximum of 30 people. The space is really guided and geared towards a yoga feel. So if you see over here, you have these built-in yoga mats that'll probably be covered with a towel or some sort of other yoga mat. And then floor lighting and these bands hanging from the ceiling are what's known as the TRX bands. You use those, you can lean into them or put your feet into them and use them for body weight exercises. But as you see, there are no um, free weights in the space and they're not proposed to be any free weights. The space itself or the studio itself is built box within a box. So we took into account the fact that this is a residential building and that there are residents above us. Below us is the parking garage, but above us are our residences. So we did do an extensive build out to soundproof the walls and the ceiling and the floor so that it's separated from the elements of the building to reduce the noise that comes from the space so as not to impact the neighbors above. The proposed hours of operation are 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, eight classes per day, again, with an average of 20 to 30 people expected per class. Currently, the space is closed. It's still under construction. Unfortunately, given the COVID um, pandemic, they, we don't really know when we'll be able to open. Currently, group classes are not allowed to be open in New York City, and we don't anticipate that changing, unfortunately, for the, for the near future. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, Brad, is Brad still on? Um, Brad, you're always the one that likes to talk on PCEs, and you're, oh, regret, that you regret that they come after they're open. This one's not opened yet, Brad. Yeah, that sounds like a mistake. <laughs> I apologize. I'll try better next time. But yeah, this space. I would say only one thing. It's vibration up the residential with the music and also here of hanging on the steel and that vibration going up to the residential. I get there's no weights. I get that. But it's usually the music um and vibrating up the steel up the building so that's why we built this as a box was in within a box as i mentioned it's not actually those those ropes that are attached to the ceiling are not attached to the steel of the building they're attached to this frame that's within the space and it's built to absorb the shock of any of any movement within the space same for the noise this is the same system that's built for spin studios and the like our music is going to be substantially less impactful given the fact that it is geared towards meditation and a, and a holistic vibe as opposed to that club atmosphere you see a lot in, in spin studios and the other gyms that this this board has seen. Varen? Uh, well, just one more oh, thing. Sorry, I'm sorry, Paul. No, go ahead. Uh, which we always regrettably ask later. Have you reached out to the tenants in the building and have they had a discussion and it's just been approved. You know, how was that communication uh, been? So we did this. Uh, unfortunately, um, we had our, our walkthrough on Friday and this question was asked to us. So I tried to get a letter from the, from the building 
it was presented to the building. The landlord that we have is on the board and presented it to the board. My client's here, he can talk to it. We were gonna get a letter, but it just didn't come in time, but it was well received by the, by the building. When you say letter, I'm asking, was this presented to the tenants above? And they yeah. signed off on it. It was presented. Because when they come back to us later, we want to remind them that they did have a say, right? And, I, and I'm glad to hear that reach out happen because you've been in front of us many times now. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just want to confirm that, Paul, uh, for the record. Yeah, no, I, it, what Jay just mentioned, Betty and I both specifically asked about a presentation of the Condo Association and if they could, in fact, the letter the letter he's referring to is a letter re, we requested from the Condo Association saying making a statement about this facility. So, Chris, were you going to add to that about the letter? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did, you know, happily receive your request for that letter um, from the condo board. We put it in on Friday, that request to my landlord. They've got a lot of moving parts right now. I fully anticipate we'll, we'll get that letter back from them th soon this week with confirmation that it's been presented to the building tenants and that everyone is very much aware on board and approves of our being there. Does that answer you, Brad? And then Varen, you, you still want to come? Yeah, just one quick question. Um, is, is this a wood frame building? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I don't, I mean, it seems to be, it seems to be a newer construction. It's a large six story building that spans 25,000 square feet. So I don't believe it's a wood frame building, but I'm not positive on that answer. I think I can speak to that if anybody, I turn myself on here. Hi. Um, that's a building that uh, was a series of buildings. There was a major fire there in the 1960s. There was a paint store and a linoleum store. And um, <clears throat> the buildings were renovated into this facade that you see, but I believe the original structures were retained underneath the facade. I can't promise that, but that's my, my recollection is that it's a sheathing of the, of the original structures. Yeah, right. If, if you go back to the interior view, we can see the wood joists below the floor. Uh, that's um, those joists are artificial. We this is oh. it's just uh, artistic design. We those oh, are part of the up by you. actually well below the ceiling. Okay. Um, I, I would imagine that at the ground floor above the basement, it would not necessarily be wood, but the rest of the structure might well be uh, wooden joists and, it's possible. and studs. Um, not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but um, that's my recollection and I've been here for 64 years. So I have a pretty good memory about structures. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that there's none of those w weights that hit the floor that shake the whole block. I have one question. I see on the plan that you wrap around onto 20, you have access onto 22nd Street, onto the residential street. Am mm -hmm. I right about that? No, the building, so you can see over here that the building wraps around to West 22nd and West 23rd. Our space is internal space. It's not, it does not have access. You don't have access to 20, to 22nd no, Street. Don't have access okay. Beyond our street frontage. Okay, got it. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, let me see if there are any attendees left at the meeting. There are none still in the room. I have uh, a question. This is Tui. Oh, go ahead, Tui. Um, I'm. I guess I'm a little confused as to the footprint because uh, it's where the old jean store used to be. But then the whole, the arrow shows the site is like expanding to like where the subway is and you're talking about this picture. Yeah, this is these are photographs that we give to the Board of Standards and Appeals. So the space is the frontage of the space is what what I'm circling here, which was OMG, which you'll tell me mm -hmm. that means I, I, I believe you. Um, mm -hmm. When we put this yellow dotted line in the arrows, that's to show the zoning lot. So we're giving the broader picture of where this space is within the context of the building. Okay, and then um, I guess my next question has to do with uh, COVID-19 and um, air circulation. Um, that studio, that's not a basement studio, right? That's the same level? Uh, ground floor, yeah. 
ground floor. So, um, but it's there's no windows. It seems from the rendering. Um, what's the circulation air circulation to be? Is it going? How's it going to be? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, so we actually installed a brand new um, HVAC system throughout the entire space, and it takes into account the re new regulations that New York State and New York City have placed on fitness facilities, um, which requires MERV 13 filters. And we've gone above and beyond and, and installed something called bipolar ionization. It's an additional um, air filtration and cl cleaning system, just because we wanna, of course, we know we're entering this marketplace in the middle of a pandemic and we want to be able to, to tout all the measures that we're, we're taking to keep the air clean and safe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, bye, Baron. thanks. Um, anybody else have any questions or concerns? This is probably gonna be one of our easiest gyms ever then. <laughs> and oh, Jay I have one more thing. Oh, I'd like to right. go. <laughs> I'd like to make sure that they know that we have a CB4 website for jobs and if they have any jobs uh, that they could post on our website, that would be great and helpful. We'd like to promote higher locally. Thank you. That's great Thank to know. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that mind of Brad. Pam? So I want to know if you're going to be offering any classes for very extremely elderly ladies with not very good knees. <laughs> we have just the class for you. I can't <laughs> so, wait. Our, 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 we plan to have a very broad audience and all of our movements are fortunately, like we discussed, body weight focused. Um, and we will have a, a, a sliding scale of uh, modifications that can be made to any anything that we're offering. We would love to have a wide range of folks. Splendid. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Just a quick question. Uh, on top of what uh, the comment about seniors, what about veterans? Are you going to be offering something like that? <laughs> I mean, veterans are, of course, more than welcome in the space. I mean, I, I personally haven't explored maybe some sort of um, some sort of program that lends well to veterans or affords them some sort of efficiencies. But I will take that and certainly give it some thought. I like that. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'd like to, uh, Betty, did you have anything you wanted to nope. raise? I'm ready for us to vote. Um, so I'd like to entertain a motion to approve this application for a PCE at the address on the, on the agenda, 217 7th Avenue. 217th Avenue. <laughs> Anybody mm -hmm. want to make that? Brett Burt makes the motion. Do I have a second? second. Kit makes a second, or Azora. I heard them all. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Um, any opposed? abstentions, present not eligible. <laughs> Bent, uh, Mike, did you have something? I saw your- He has a cough, did you hear that? Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if there was uh, some abstention or something. Okay, great. <laughs> I had a cough on Zoom during All the- right. So Sorry. Jay and Chris, thank you for your patience tonight. And Jay, this is probably one of the easiest gym applications you've had before, so I'm glad I, you got through it. What it's worth, I've, I seem to recall Mrs. Wolf doing deadlifts at Brick Fitness. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thanks, Thank you. Good luck to you. Anybody else have any other issues, new or old business they want to discuss? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Well. I appreciate it. Nice long Thank meeting. You, Paul. Appreciate it. Okay, bye. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Pam, are you still in Truro? Hmm? Oh, you're muted, oh. Pam. Muted, muted. Yep. Um, I'm supposed to be in Truro, but with some doctor appointment I was supposed to have got canceled, and now I have to stick around for that. But we are planning to leave tomorrow afternoon. It's oh, getting nice. cold. It's getting cold, it's, right? It's always colder up there than here. Right. <laughs> We're very snug in our house. We're heated with cast iron, New York City style cast iron radiators and hot water system. And in Truro? A, 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 yes, in Truro. Isn't that nice. amazing? We're New Yorkers. So when we 
when we <laughs> went to rise the house, we, we bought a mess of very large radiators. Awesome. And they I'm keep so it jealous. toasty warm. Um, it's propane, but there you go. And we right. have a big, we also have a big fireplace and lots and lots of firewood. Awesome. Right. Safe really travels. So I'll, I'll, post, I'll post pictures of the turkeys. <laughs> yes, please do. All right. Safe I travels. mean, the Safe. ones that walk around and fly. Right, right, right. Not the one on the platter. Not the one on your table. <laughs> Not the one on the platter. I don't think we're doing that this time. Stay well. <laughs> All of you, All right. stay well. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, Pam. Thanks. And Betty, you and I will talk tomorrow or the next day about this. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I will. I'll, tr I'll, I'll do the first draft. Awesome. Thank you. I, I wanted to congratulate Paul on his uh, Brown Harris Stevens um, um, yeah. email I saw. Thanks. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a nice new gig. It's the same job I had, but just new firm. But thank you, though, Tui. I appreciate that. Okay. Right. I just got Good a cramp night. in my leg. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Walk around, Paul. Yeah, all right, see ya.